All right, guys, this is Box Reviews. Coming at you guys with my review for Succession Season 2, Episode 4. All right, so we're back for another episode of Succession this week, and I don't know, guys, I'm getting ready to crown this one uh, the best TV show uh, out there right now. Honestly, I think right now, as the season is airing, I think it's the best thing on TV, um, and it, like I said last week, like this might be my the best show of, of 2019 for me. Um, this episode, I think, is right up there with the finale for last season in terms of the best episodes of the series. Um, I thought this one was just uh, really, really incredible. Um, again, what I've been, you know, really talking about a lot with this show, and and so far within these first three episodes, uh, in in specific, is the 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 ability to balance comedy and drama. And in this episode, again, I thought the comedy and drama were both there. And even towards the end of this episode, the drama maybe even more so. Um, and I think when this series gets dramatic, the actors really show up, and and they really do um, carry those scenes that they need to be dramatic in. And they need to be serious and and then that kind of changes the tone along with them. And so I thought that was just really, really well done in this episode. Anyways, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts of the episode. What did you think of it? Um, you know, is it one of the best episodes of the series for you? I've seen a lot of people on Twitter uh, saying it's their favorite episode of the series now. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Love to discuss that with you. And also, what are some of your predictions going forward? I will touch on some of mine. Uh, towards the end of the video here, uh, but I'd love to hear what you guys kind of see going forward in the future with the Roys and uh, and all this, all the things that are going, all all the dynamics with these characters. I'd love to hear that. But anyways, if you enjoyed the review, please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Would really appreciate that as well. Also, really want to thank you guys. Um, had some comments, some likes, uh, and and uh, quite a few people are checking out the reviews. So I really appreciate that. And I definitely am going to keep going uh, week to week. Uh, hopefully, I've tried to get these out Mondays, but it is what it is. Um, but hopefully, we'll we'll kind of get back on track with that as well. But anyway, so without any further ado, let's get into a bit of a recap of this episode, talking about some of the major moments uh, from this one. We had kind of, I would say, three kind of plots going on, but one main plot, a couple subplots. So we'll talk about those uh, in depth. And then we'll get to my rating, fair character, and some more overall thoughts and predictions, as I said off the top, as to what I might see, uh, or as, I, as, as what I see uh, might happen going forward. So anyways, so uh, first we're going to talk about Roman, and this is pretty much all I'm going to talk about him. Uh, his part was pretty significant in the episode. Um, of course, the one scene that I think everybody is talking about is the one with him and Jerry at the very end. Um, and uh, usually I follow chronological order with these recaps, uh, but this one I had to talk about right off the bat. So uh, I just, it was a weird scene that I didn't really see going that way at all at first. Um, but then it did. They, they went there. Um, so that was an interesting one. I don't really have much of a comment there other than I thought Jerry was kind of a mother figure for these kids. Um, and for Roman, maybe especially, you know, especially given the scene that we got last episode with them, um, it seemed like she was more of, of, of his mother, right? In, in a way, not his, um, you know, like someone that he's turned on by necessarily. Um, and that scene just, uh, played out really odd. Um, anyways, I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on that one, I guess. I've seen a lot of different reactions and stuff, um, but that is definitely a scene that needs to be talked about. Anyways, so uh, we see Roman joins his six-week training program in parks, thanks to Jerry. Uh, of course, he doesn't like it there, though, and he's not handling it well to begin, uh, as he tells this couple at the park. He's dressed up as one of, he's in costume as one of the, um, you know, mascots, I guess, or, or um, you know, one of the, the, you know, animals that people stop and take pictures with, um, kind of like the characters at Disney World, right? So anyways, he tells a couple to fuck off, and that the husband isn't pleasing her enough, or something like that, while in costume, so just being really mean to, uh, to the visitors that want to take pictures with him and all that, so nothing too surprising, right? Roman's an asshole, we kind of knew that already, um, and he's being an asshole in this, uh, in this scene as well, um, but I will say this is an interesting step for Roman's character, um, and I will say that I think this was the weakest part of the episode. But I do like that they put his character in this because I think this is a good. This is going to humble him a little bit, um, you know, whether that actually does or not. Um, at least that's what they're kind of setting up for, and that's also what Jerry kind of echoes to him while they're, you know, they have numerous phone calls in this episode. Of course, not the end one, um, but yeah. So. 
just an interesting experience putting Roman somewhere where he wouldn't usually be, and I kind of like switching up a bit. Uh, and then later he finds a guy named Brian and partners up with him for the rest of the day. But before they can pitch their project, uh, right, so the teacher says partner up, they, you know, they kind of get together to pitch a new project or a new idea for a ride, I believe. And so before they can they can get that idea, they can do the pitch and all that stuff, he is evacuated from the place for safety after the incident at the office, which of course I'll talk about at length a little bit later, probably in a few minutes here. And so thankfully for him, he doesn't have to do this pitch. He doesn't have to get up in front of the class with uh, with Brian and... and um, and work on this pitch he's taken to this like little side room right like a, a photocopier room or something like that and this one guy is just guarding the room um and so of course the title of the episode safe room so that's roman safe room in a way uh and then we see later to his surprise their pitch actually wins later in the day uh and he takes a liking to the brian guy as a result um you know, actually, he seems actually happy, and he actually starts respecting Brian a little bit. Um, you kind of feel for Brian here, and then also he tells Jerry that he wants to bring Brian in to the company as well, like, as kind of a, a reward um, for what he's seen of him in the last uh, last day or so, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting. Of course, Robin, right off the bat, he's like, oh, well, they only picked us because of my name, and then apparently, I don't think we see that scene, but they go back and uh, apparently it was because the pitch was the the best, right? Um, so I thought that was interesting too, and also shows that Roman isn't just a, you know a total moron, right? Like Logan uh, says last episode, uh, he does know what he's doing. It's just like he has a totally different approach to things that doesn't really fit the business side of things, right? The professionalism side. Um, but he does maybe know what he's doing at, at times, right? Uh, but anyway, so I thought this, again, was the weakest part of the episode, and that's why I'm not going to talk much more about it. Um, but I did think it was nice to put his character in that, and uh, I'm hoping we see more of Brian. I liked him uh, in the scenes we got. So, all right. So then we get to the main plot of the episode, uh, and Logan finally brings Shiv in for the day to simply observe. Uh, so this was an interesting one. Of course, at the end of last episode, we ended with, um, you know, it's time to bring you in, right? That line. Um, we saw Shiv just elated at that point, really excited. And so she is brought in to observe, but we quickly get the idea that this idea of letting her observe is a little bit different than what she was expecting, right? Uh, so Logan putting her in a different office won't even let her be in his office and and working at the table, right? He says that's that's Kendall's spot. Uh, so then he shoes her out of the room when Kendall comes in to talk about anything serious, right? So I thought I, I, again, right? This is kind of. Um, really showing exactly how Logan really feels, right? Shiv thinks she's getting a CEO position. You know, she's coming in for the day to, you know, be brought up to speed on things. And even Logan says, we, we might get your your perspective on the PR of this of, of this problem with their anchor man, right? That uh, kind of carries through the entire episode here. And then that never actually happens though, really. Shiv isn't allowed to share her opinion on it. Um, and so I thought that was a really interesting spin. And again, it just shows... Okay, like, Logan doesn't actually really respect her. Um, I think he's just kind of dangling this carrot in front of her, which is the CEO job, right? Um, and so we kind of see that play out very quickly here, right? She's there to observe, but anything serious or anything official, she has to leave the room for, right? And think of, like, she's the daughter, right? Like, she's the daughter of the, of the family. It's not like she's a nobody from off the street that they don't want knowing about this stuff, right? So, uh, I love this part, too, though, where Kendall comes in and he's now giving Logan his medication. <laughs> this was really great because, again... That, I mean, it is kind of played for a little bit of a joke with Shiv here, um, you know, which is funny. He looks really awkward just coming in and, and you know, putting together the medication pills. They say the the old uh, person who was doing it missed the dose, and so now they've just been totally, uh, you know, probably fired, right? Kendall takes over the job. And again, I just think this shows that Kendall is really on his side. Like, he trusts Kendall to give him the right medication now. And Kendall's just kind of trotting a little behind him with this medication now. Uh, so it really is is a really stark difference here. And again, we saw that a lot in last episode. Um, and this one a lot um, as well. We, we really see that play out here. Um, and again, Shiv kind of plays for a joke, which is pretty funny. So then we see later Logan and the inner circle, as he calls it, right? Um, so pretty much, you know, the main players, Carl, Jerry, Tom, um, Kendall, Roman would be there, but, you know, he's off on the train program. Anyways, so he, as he calls um, the inner circle, 
He calls this meeting and they come together in the boardroom uh, where they discuss what they should do with the news anchor at ATN who has been exposed for his fascist remarks and actions. Um, and one of the things is that he gets married at Hitler's retreat in Bavaria, right? At the, at the palace right below it or something like that um, in the past. Um, that happened and then what was he was also at a, a fascist meeting or something like that and then we find out later that he also named his dog after Hitler's dog uh and so just a lot of a lot of things and I like how Logan says well that's a pretty big coincidence right that he got married at the church at Hitler's retreat and all these connections are coming out about him so after the the uh, ATN woman who we already met who Tom had a little run-in with in episode two there so after she says that he does good ratings and that firing him would be caving to the demand of of the people, right? Demanding his head, if you will, um, demanding that he should be fired. And so they cave to that. That could impact their public image, right? And I like how she says, well, if we do this, then who's next, right? Like anybody could be fired then. And Logan, right, like right away when she says this, anything affecting their public image right now, Logan is going to avoid at all costs, right? So Logan says they will keep him on as they want to back talent. Um, I love that. And, and it is true, right? So she says that he does good ratings for them. He gets the people there. And I will say, too, as we see outside in the building, this kind of plays out in the episode as well, that he actually has quite a few fans, too. So to ignore the, the fact that people are listening and tuning into the news uh, channel because of him, uh, would be a pretty ignorant thing to do, right? Like, they gotta, right, they gotta, even though he's doing these terrible things, which, of course, I mean, you know, he'd be fired probably into in today's, um, um, in today's kind of uh, background, right? It, give him more context to this, of course. But um, I just think it's a, a legitimate thing, right? Like, oh, he's doing ratings. Well, we want to back talent. So I thought that was a pretty funny thing there. Logan says, he all orders Tom, though, to turn his guts inside out, he says. So to learn a little bit more about him so that more of this stuff about him doesn't get out, right? So that it doesn't get any worse. Um, and so... And this kind of just means, you know, check into him, right? Make sure that we know everything that, that is, is is actually about him instead of all these leaks and all this, uh, you know, exposition uh, or, you know, um, him being exposed in, in, in public, right? So I just thought this was a like, great task for Tom, uh, putting the character in such a, a, an awesome situation here, such an entertaining situation, I guess. Um, and I loved in this scene, too, how Tom is being coached by Shiv from the side, uh, you know, and she's kind of sitting in, in the corner of the room, and Logan says, like, she's not here, don't listen to her, or whatever, um, and so again, really condescending to her, and I just like this, that, you know, she's kind of trying to, trying to, you know, get her opinion, and getting Tom to voice it, and she doesn't actually get that say at the table, which again, right, condescending, he doesn't actually want her there, she really is there just to observe, um, and at least she's welcome to sit into this meeting too, I mean, that's something uh, to consider as well, because he kind of shoes her out of every other room uh, in the uh, in the episode here where stuff is going on, so anyways, uh, we see Tom really beholden to Shiv still, uh, of course, Right, that's the way that relationship is. So, uh, there we see before Kendall brings in the Pierce CEO, which we got last episode to end off. Frank said that he got the connection, right, and that she was willing to come in and help them. So, he checks in on Shiv, who has just been told by Jerry about Kendall's theft problem, uh, how he's been stealing vape fluid. Uh, and we saw a glimpse of this at the end of episode one, I believe, uh, where he steals, I think it was a pack of batteries, if I remember correctly, uh, from that little convenience store. Um, and he, or, or is it a light or something like that where he steals this thing and then he just throws it in the garbage in, in the garbage can right outside after he leaves um, and so that was just kind of a throwaway thing wondering like what you know what like what reason is that for right why is that a thing um, and so I'm wondering if this actually could be a thing going forward. And of course, it is brought up in this later conversation between Shiv and Kendall. And so I'm wondering if, you know, and, and I really like that. I like these things that are, that seem like nothing and then really get brought in to the forefront of, uh, of, of the plot and really, um, you know, are used to actually further the, these characters and further this development. And that's something Better Call Saul does uh, the best, uh, the, definitely the best on TV right now, but Breaking Bad was, uh, also amazing at that, one of my favorite things about those two shows, but anyways, um, so I thought this was something that I do need to talk about, because I feel like it's gonna come up later, anyways, so he's stealing Fate Fluid and some other stuff, um, as well, so as they talk then, 
Shiv and Kendall, uh, the girl comes in and tells uh, Kendall that she is en route, right? Not being any specific, not specifying who she is, as Shiv and Jerry are there in the room, right? And this is a thing that Logan said, only Kendall and him are going to be in the meeting, but also, of course, Frank knows as well, but he wants to keep it limited to just those three. He doesn't want anybody else to know what's going on. So Kendall says he can't tell Shiv about it, and she tells him, I, I thought this was one of the best lines of the episode, if not, I mean, probably the end scene between Shiv and Kendall were, were really great, but this line was really awesome. So Shiv says, you seem to be mistaking me with someone you're in competition with, right? So she's saying, you know, you're not telling me this, you know, and, and you're treating me like someone on the other side, like I'm your sister, right? Like, why aren't you, why aren't you able to tell me these things? Um, and I thought this was such a great line because from Shiv's point of view, it's like, um, yeah, he is in competition with you because you just got named CEO, right? Of course, he doesn't know that, but I just love the way that that, uh, that line means so much to us, but to both of those characters, uh, or at least to Kendall especially, it's like, oh, well, you know, okay, you know, good point, but he actually is in competition with her. That's the funny thing about this, um, and so anyways, I love that line. So finally, the CEO woman, uh, Rhea, I believe, or Rhea, uh, arrives uh, through the underground garage to avoid the commotion out front uh, between these Antifa protesters and then the Anchorman supporters. I've really, I didn't get his name, uh, I, Mark is his first name, right, but Ravenhand or something like that was his last name, the Anchorman guy, but anyways, um, so he has a lot of supporters out there on the sidewalk out front of the ATN building, um, but then the Antifa a group of Antifa shows up, and uh, and which is really fitting, by the way. I like that they they're kind of adding these modern touches while still kind of building their own world, right? Like there's not you know a CNN in this in this uh, kind of world that the show takes place in, um, but they kind of have the equivalence to all the different uh, media outlets, and uh, of course they they have Antifa in this. So I think it's just really interesting that they connect um, you know the current stuff while also kind of creating this own world and this own kind of level of, uh, I guess, a playing field, if you will, between all these media places. So, um, anyways, I thought that was really cool. So then, as she meets with Logan and Kendall in his office, she tells them the message from the Pierce family is a nuanced fuck off. So, I thought this was really great. Um, and I forget um, the actress's name here, but I have seen her in a lot of other things. Um, I thought she was actually really great. Is it Holly Porter? I really don't want to get this wrong, but I feel like that might be it anyways, um, I think it's Holly something, um, regardless, um, she was really great, but anyways, in this scene, uh, really great, so she says a nuanced fuck off, right, uh, and so that basically, and, and, and that the Pierce family knows exactly what they're up to, right, um, there's no secret anymore, they know exactly what Logan is trying to do, and they're not letting it happen, is essentially the message, and, you know, so much for Frank saying that she's gonna help them, right, like, this is a totally different, uh, you know, a totally different message than probably what they were expecting, right, so she also doesn't really want to help them either, from a personal standpoint, just individually, as she tells them that she takes her orders from the higher-ups, and she's merely, uh, or she's a mere tool of them, right, She's the CEO of Pierce, um, you know, but but she takes orders from the family, and that's it, right? Like, that's it. She is not there to help them out, and uh, her kind of individual opinion on the, on, the, on the deal doesn't matter. And so this meeting was essentially a big waste of time all the way around um, because she's not willing to help, and Pierce is not willing to do business with them and tells them to fuck off. Uh, and so this obviously doesn't go the way Logan and Kendall wanted it to, but of course later on in the episode this comes back. And it kind of comes full circle a little bit too, um, whereas this scene is actually important to to the later scene. Um, but again, I thought it's just a really great acted up or a great acted scene here as well. So then we get to Tom. So this was again, you know, I, I'm going to comment on this a little bit later too, where I thought this episode did such a great job at, but it's putting these characters into just perfect situations, right? Like they have a situation where somebody has to interview, somebody has to. Um, what did Logan say again? Uh, turn his guts inside out, right? So someone has to turn this anchor man who's been accused of these fascist things, and, you know, he may very well be a fascist or, a, or you know, a fascist sympathizer, supporter. Um, and, uh, and so somebody has to interview them and turn their guts inside out. Who's one character that you love to see do that? It's Tom, right? And that's exactly the way they play this out. So it's just so perfect. And that's what this show does really great, putting these characters into such great situations um, that fit them really, really well. So anyways, 
We see Tom interview the anchorman, Mark, uh, I believe it's Raven Hand, anyways, about his dog na dog's name after Hitler's dog, and so just, like, a lot of things connecting. He also asks him how many, time, uh, how many times he's read Mein Kampf, uh, <laughs> and the guy says, oh, a couple times, right? Like, a few times I've read it. I've uh, just skimmed, right? And it's like, um, <laughs> you know, like, what? Right? Um, you know, and I think it's fair... I think, um, so, you know, some history, um, you know, classes, and if you are a historian, I'm sure that people have read Mein Kampf, probably not every word of it, um, but, you know, that's common, but to say that you've read it a couple times or a few times uh, might be a little suspect, right, um, unless you're doing, like, a really in-depth research project or a study on it. Uh, that might be a little bit suspect, especially given his other accusations. And so Tom is kind of getting a little bit skeptical here. And then we see them talk about the uh, number of fatalities during World War II. Um, and then this guy doesn't even bring up the Holocaust. And so anyways, just kind of giving these little things in here that, okay, this guy probably might be, you know, what people are saying he is. But anyways, uh, so before any of that can be resolved... Uh, before Tom can accuse him of anything or say anything more, suddenly they hear a loud bang sound. Sounds like a gunshot, uh, followed by the alarm sounding. So Tom is immediately shuffled along with Greg to the panic room, while Logan, Shiv, Jerry, and Rhea are taken to the safe room, which actually looks like a bunker, right? Like, this place is... Um, I believe they said bulletproof, the walls, right, the door, everything is just, it's a safe room, really, right, like, nobody's getting in there, nobody can do any damage to them, and meanwhile, Tom and Greg, and a couple other people, uh, are taken by the security guard to this, like, again, random, like, photocopier room, similar to Roman's room, uh, where he gets taken, so, we see Tom is trying to get to the real safe room to see Shiv, as they took him just to a normal room, uh, just hilarious, right, and, uh, and I love the part where Greg, um, you know, is saying, you know, like, they could send an attack uh, child in here, and that, they could easily fit through that window and stuff. So just so funny here that they're so paranoid, and as of now, they think it was an Antifa shooter who got into the building and was, like, shooting them up, right? Um, and then they, they, you know, they think, oh, they're coming for the family and stuff, so Tom and Greg just become really paranoid here, which makes for an even funnier scene that follows, um... Where, you know, both of them essentially, uh, you know, they're, they're paranoid, they're panicking, they say all these crazy things. And then later, as Tom and the others begin to relax in the panic room, right, that, yeah, I believe the security guard, I think we're safe, they just want to do a little sweep and then we're good to go, right? So, he kind of calms them all down. And, and, by the way, like, the other two people in the room are not worried at all. Like, they're not even panicking. Um, it's just Greg and Tom, right? Ridiculous. But anyways, um, so they start to relax in the panic room and Greg takes this opportunity to ask Tom if they can have a little bit of a conversation, uh, which, by the way, is just kind of awkward in itself with the other people there in the room, uh, but anyways, so this, this is, like, one of the better scenes, I think, between Greg and Tom, uh, in, in the series, so Greg tells Tom that he would like to get out from under his giant shadow, right, so I love the way he words these things, and, uh, you know, obviously making Tom feel better, giant shadow, right, as if he's, you know, some, like, big guy that's so impressive, right? And so, Greg says he wants to try to work for someone else in a different place in the company, as he doesn't like the ATN experience and just kind of the environment that is around this place, uh, you know? And so, you know, he, he's kind of saying, like, I don't really like ATN. I don't think it's even necessarily that he doesn't like Tom, or perhaps it is, and he's just using ATN as an excuse. Um, but I think it really is mainly ATN, especially after he uh, had that conversation about his principles, right, early on in the season. Um, he just really doesn't like it, and, and Tom doesn't really either, to be honest, but he's kind of in it, and he, of course he's going to accept this role. And so... I really like this uh, scene here where Greg's like, well, I, I don't really like this. Like, I'd rather work somewhere else. Um, and so Tom just, like, flips out. So at first, this causes Tom to get really emotional. He starts even tearing up, we see. And then he just gets really angry all of a sudden. And so he gets really angry. He starts chucking water bottles at Greg from across the room. He says, I will not let you do this to me. I will not let go of what is mine, right? So he's taking ownership over Greg here and saying, you know, what is mine, right? Um, and then, you know, Greg says, like, security, like, help, right? Because he's getting these water bottles just pelted at him. And honestly, like, full water bottles, like, that, you know, 
not going to injure you, not going to break any bones or anything like that, but, you know, it hurts, right? Get, you know, basically thrown water bottles in the shins, right? So he tells, tells the security guard, the security, right? And then Tom says, back off, right? Uh, so he tells the security guard to back off and says, this is executive level business or something like that. And so the security guard just backs, he just backs off. Tom just keeps throwing water bottles at Greg. Just such a funny scene, just such a great one. Um, and I thought in a more serious note, um, I thought it could be Greg's use of the term a business open relationship that set off Tom because I think that's the last line before Tom starts kind of throwing the water bottles at him. And I thought this would be, it would make sense because it's kind of a parallel to Tom's romantic relationship with Shiv. And we've seen in the past that he's not really okay with the whole open relationship idea. And that's really not two-sided. It's really only Shiv who gets the open relationship. Um... Uh, part of that uh, of that kind of deal that they have um, and so I thought that might have been a line that kind of uh, you know triggered Tom I guess if you will um, and, and kind of um, set, set him off right in this scene um, but it, it, it is you know it's just hilarious anyways it doesn't really matter what set him off it's just a hilarious scene now regardless but um, anyway so yeah business open relationship Greg says and then he's like well but I'll come back and work for you right so just a, such an awesome scene here and the, the awkwardness from Greg really plays out here as well. So later then in the safe room bunker, we're back to the real safe room. Kendall finally arrives uh, and Logan gets up to hug him immediately. Again, like this is such a different relationship than we've seen before. And this really, um, um, really uh, gives kind of fuel to the fire what Shiv was saying before about something's going on here between you and dad, right? And, and this really does. I mean... This scene where Kendall, why, and, and Logan's like worried about Kendall too up to this point. And so when he finally arrives, he like gets up to hug him immediately. And uh, obviously he didn't do the same for Shiv. When she came in the room, he just stayed sitting there. He didn't really care. But when Kendall walks in, he like gets up to hug him. And so I thought that was definitely an interesting thing and something that like is really gonna, gonna matter going forward there as well with that relationship. And so then Jerry uh, then tells them the news that it was just an, uh, well, I shouldn't say just, but you know what I mean. Like, obviously this is a big difference compared to an Antifa active shooter in the building. But anyway, so it was an ATN employee who actually shot themselves and committed suicide in the building. Um, and, and who talked about, like, being bullied, a, a bullying atmosphere, I think, or something like that within ATN. Um... And so that's an interesting uh, thing as well that they're going to try to spin uh, their own way, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's not an Antifa shooter as they thought. Which, again, you know, it, it just kind of makes this whole sequence of them going to the safe room and Robin being protected at this trading program. Like, all of it just seemed ludicrous, right? Like, somebody committed suicide there and they were, like, taken to a bunker. You know what I mean? So, um no active shooter, nothing like that. Uh, but I just love the way that they play this up and the, the way that these characters react and they like believe it right away. Like, oh, there's a sh shooter in the building and all this stuff because they're so... I'm not sure if, it, if arrogant is the right word, but they think so much of themselves that they think shooters are going to target the family here uh, and try to kill them. And so they, then they have to go to a bunker in the building. So anyways, I thought that was just a really great uh, part here. And I would I think it would have been... Uh, not as well done if it actually would have been an Antifa shooter and they would have, you know, caught him. I think this actually plays a lot better with the episode. But anyways, um, so then the discussion, right after they're told it was just a suicide, so everyone's kind of relaxing a little bit, yet uh, I believe it's Carl who tells them, uh, or is it Carl? No, that's not Carl, it's the other guy. Um, he tells them they got to do a sweep a little bit. They got to hold them for 20 more minutes. Then, then they'll be okay to go back. So the discussion then spins back into the deal with Pierce as Shiv starts talking to Rhea about their meeting earlier, um, which this was just a really annoying scene, to be perfectly honest with you, from Shiv. Um, but it actually turned out pretty well. So... Kendall then starts throwing out numbers to get her to bite, essentially, you know, saying like 20, 20.5, 21 million, uh, 21 billion, 21.5 billion, right? So he's just spitting out these numbers. And meanwhile, Shiv is like strategizing, I guess. She keeps trying to strategize with uh, Rhea about the good and bad of the deal, like talking about the consequences and the, and the, and the positives of partnering up and stuff. And, uh, you know, says like, is he allowed to do that? Like, is Kendall just allowed to throw in numbers like that and stuff? This was just such an annoying scene. I have to be honest. I mean, um, just a really annoying scene. And eventually, Logan, she just tells her to shut up, essentially, right? Like, he, I don't think he says that exactly, but he just looks at her and it's like, 
shut up, right? Like, you know, just like shut your mouth for right now. Um, and I kind of felt the same way here. It's like, she really doesn't know a lot what she's talking about. Um, and I just, I don't know, like this was just a really annoying scene here as well. Um, but I will say one, one thing is that I think it's well done in the fact that Shiv is like a political, um, I, I guess pundit, right? So she is always looking at, you know, the bad, the good of all these things. And so this is really like political of her. And that's why I think she's such, uh, she's such better off in that type of field and that type of environment rather than business and negotiation and all this stuff with, with the family, with Waystar. So again, I really feel bad for her that she left her job with, um, with a, a Gil, right? I also love that they're keeping this up where Kendall says like, oh, you got fired. And then she said, no, no, I walked out. Right. So I, I love that too. That was really funny. But anyways, so eventually Logan just tells her to shut up. Uh, and, and this is also after he, she says like, oh, well, who's going to take over after you're gone and stuff. Obviously that's going to hit a sore spot for Logan. Uh, so he tells her shut up. And then he offers Rhea $24 billion, uh, which the Pierce company was estimated at $20 billion, So they're overpaying by a little bit here. And the biggest thing about this is that Rhea tells the Pierce family that they can trust him to keep on all of their people employed uh, when they take over, right? And that's a big thing that the Pierce family is going to care about is to keep those people on while they take over. Instead of just gutting it similar to Volter that we saw, right? They're going to keep those uh, people employed. They're going to keep the same things going while they take over. And I think the Pierce family is going to, you know, that's going to matter to them. And so he says, you know, tell them that you trust me and that they should be able to trust me as well. Um, he also tells her, because when I say something will happen, that thing will happen. And he says, am I right, kids? And uh, Shiv and Kendall both reply, right, like right away. Um, and it really is, like they do know that for sure. Right, when Logan says something will happen, that thing happens. Like it, it really does. Like that is the control that he has like not just in business, but over the family and the kids too, and they know what uh, they know it more than anybody, right? Like they know it better than anybody. So um, I thought that was also a really great thing there too. Anyways, so Logan thinks that trust will be a big factor, and if Rhea can convince the Pierce family that he can be trusted, they may actually be successful in this deal. And of course, paying uh, or overpaying four billion might actually help them too. So anyways, that's kind of where we end up with the Rhea CEO, um, you know, plot of this episode. She also says at the very end that they should fire this Raven Hand guy um, because I believe it's the Pierce, uh, the, the wife of Pierce, right, doesn't like him at all. And so it'd be a good peace offering. So we'll have to see uh, what happens with that. I think Logan might do it, obviously, if he wants Pierce. Anyways, um, so yeah, again, just Shiv is kind of annoying in this scene. I get that she wants to get involved finally. And, you know, I think that she should. I think Logan should let her be more involved. Um, but she clearly is not very good at negotiating something like this. And I think she was just really out of place um, in this scene. She's better with the optics of things. She's better with the PR uh, standpoint. She's not good at being in a room and negotiating with the other side. And that's something that I just felt was a little annoying in this scene. Um, but again, like not the, not a bad thing, not a knock to the writing here, not a knock to her acting. I just think in this scene, it's just like watching Shiv being like that. You can kind of see why Logan's a little bit hesitant to just make her CEO tomorrow. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's the way that one uh, wraps up there. All right, so then we shift to the other uh, room, right? The other safe room, the panic room. So Tom apologizes to Greg uh, for, uh, you know, of course they're let out after this, right? They figure out that it was a suicide. And another interesting thing too is that the suicide was on the floor that Tom and Greg were on, right? And they actually look over towards the room where the guy was who killed himself. Um, and so that's also why they heard the sound louder than all the other people. Anyways, so Tom apologizes for losing his temper with the water bottles and kind of just plays it off like, it was nothing, right? He says, you know, I, I don't like everything about me or something like that, right? And it's like, yeah, like, you just threw water. And, and Greg's like, yeah, it really wasn't cool. Like, you know, so anyways, no, that was good. And then Greg just doubles down. So Greg is sticking to his guns about leaving. He says, you know, like, no, like, I still plan on leaving, right? Like, Tom is just trying to play this off and saying, like, oh, okay, it's fine. And Greg's like, uh, no, like, I still kind of want to leave, right? So then Tom, uh, this is just so great. So Tom is like, what, like, 
are you serious? Like, you want to leave? And then, Greg, uh, this is just such a great delivery by Nicholas Braun here. So Cousin Greg, right? So he then tells Tom in the most awkward way possible that he kept some copies of those documents from last season's kind of cruise death pit situation thing that played out. Um, and, of course, we remember, right, that he did keep those those documents. We were wondering, like, what is what is that for? Like, what's going on there? And this is exactly the situation where Greg uh, could use them. And that's the exact reason why he kept them there is because he knew that eventually he might need something to get, uh, you know, out from under Tom. And so that he is basically using them as blackmail against Tom. But again, the most awkward way possible. He's like, well, it's, it's not blackmail. Like, I don't want to use them. But anyway, so just such a hilarious moment here in which Tom responds with giving him a promotion now uh, and just... Um, you know, saying like, oh, you got a spot at the table now. How would you like that and that stuff? So Greg, of course, is just really giddy. He's like, oh, yeah, like that would be that would be pretty good. That would be cool. And then Tom just seems very impressed by this. Like he's so impressed with Greg that he's finally stepped up and just like blackmailed somebody and even blackmailed him. Um, and so he's kind of acting all impressed. He's kind of laughing it off and all this stuff. And then he says like, where are those documents, Greg? Right? Like, cause he's trying to play it off and trying to get Greg to tell him where the documents are so that he can burn them. And then basically, you know, in, enslave Greg, right? For lack of a, uh, well, I guess there is a better term, but you know what I mean, right? In, in Tom's eyes, he'd be enslaving Greg again once he picks up these documents and gets this blackmail on him. But it's just so funny, right? Matthew McFadden is like, uh, in, in this delivery, he's just awesome, right? He's like, where, where are these documents, Greg? Like, they kind of talking to him, laughing. So, anyways, thought it was a really great scene. And we see Greg finally standing up for himself. Uh, this was just really impressive. I mean, you know, this is something that we have not seen from Greg up until this point. Uh, and this was great. I will also say that this is interesting timing here because this is after Tom kept his secret in Hungary, which is a pretty big deal. So for him to kind of betray Tom in this uh, in this way um, was, you know, I, I think it actually was meaningful. Like, this shows that Greg is really not... Um, is 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 kind of um you know he's like tom like he's like the others he's just um you know he doesn't really care about people's feelings and all that stuff he's willing to blackmail tom even after he just kept the secret in hungary although he did just throw water bottles at him of course but um you know i thought they had a pretty good relationship but anyways so greg backstabs him here now i want to touch on this because it was a big part in the episode and probably one of my favorite parts. Like, this was so good. So, Connor and Willa at 10 Moe's are apparently uh, better known as Mo Lester's funeral uh, on behalf of the family, right? Because the family are forced to stay at the at the building at, on lockdown, right? And so, they were all planning to attend Moe's funeral here. Um, of course, we heard this guy died last episode uh, who was talking to the biography lady, right? And so, they can't come. So, Connor is essentially representing the whole family now that he's going to the funeral. And so Connor also sees this as an opportunity to ask for campaign donations from the other wealthy businessman uh, that worked with, with, with Mo, but also his dad, right? And so he sees this kind of circle of these guys going down and, and, and seeing this as a big opportunity to get some donations. Uh, and he says he has a donor boner. Um, just like a hilarious moment. And Alan Ruck was just amazing in this uh, sequence here. So while at the service, then we see the biography lady approaches Connor and tells him that she talked to Mo a lot at the end of his life, which of course he already knows. Um, and, and Connor knows exactly who she is, right? He knows right away that she's working on the biography and that he is not going to talk to her. He tells her, to write Connor was interested in politics from a young age right and that's all he says to her right he, I believe he tells her like four times to say to write that right that's the thing that she needs to write in the biography she's not you know he's not gonna get she's not gonna get any comment out of him beyond that right so then she tells him that she's looking forward to his speech right his eulogy at the funeral to see how he felt about Mo and so this just makes for such a, a, an amazing sequence here because now she's there. Like, now she's sitting at the church, and anything that he says in that eulogy could be used in the biography against him. So this just makes for, again, a hilarious moment here. Uh, so we see Willa has to rewrite the eulogy, like, literally, like, a minute before he goes up there, to basically, uh, to make it so that it doesn't convey any of his feelings. Like, anything. It, it pretty much is just pointing out facts 
about what happened so the biography lady can't twist and turn any of the things he says. And so it turns out to be the most awkward, unsentimental eulogy ever. Like, ever. And it's just so funny. Uh, it leaves the wife dumbfounded. I loved her face in this, where Connor... I, I like Some of this stuff, he's like, Mo is dead, and we all die, right? <laughs> and that's pretty much it. So just a hilarious moment here. And uh, it really is a shame that he couldn't present his original eulogy that he wrote, which included, Lester touched us all, right? So <laughs> this whole thing was just such a funny shtick with the whole Mo Lester thing. Um, and, and the whole part with Willa, how she goes and talks to some of Mo's friends and says, like, was this time where they didn't have laws? Like, Connor's like, oh, it was a different time, right? Like, Dad didn't trust us to go in the pool with him, but... You know, like, and all this stuff, like, just so funny here. And Alan Ruck, again, I think this was maybe his best performance up to date. Uh, this sequence was just awesome. Like, Lester touched us all, right, uh, because he's called Mo Lester. Anyways, so just a hilarious uh, sequence here. And again, we see the biography lady kind of getting to Connor. But if, and, and also, too, like, he doesn't want to hurt Logan, but he also doesn't want to hurt his image as well because he's running for president. So that is also something to consider, too. So then to end, I'll try to make this quick, but it's such a powerful scene. Uh, best uh, scene of the episode, hands down, um, between Shiv and Kendall. So Shiv confronts him once again about what's going on between him and Dad and why they are so close all of a sudden. Which, I mean, I think the viewers are also asking that question, right? So Kendall says... And he isn't blackmailing dad. They did. They don't have a deal with, uh, with each other about it as Shiv kind of thinks that they do. Instead, he says that he's, you know, Logan's just simply concerned about him right now for whatever reason. And if she wants to know the reason, right, she's going to have to ask Logan. He can't tell her the reason. And obviously the reason, I think at least, I think we all, we all think is the car accident from the finale, right? I think that is um, the reason that he's talking about why they have been so close uh, because of this big secret that he has over him, right? So she tells him to look at her in which he says, it's not gonna be me, right? Saying, uh, as in, you know, he won't be chosen to be the CEO, right? Logan is not going to pick him to be the CEO, even though it looks like they're really close right now and that he's kind of in the, in the lead, it's not gonna be him. Right? Like, Logan's not going to choose him. Um, which is interesting because, of course, we know Shiv has already been chosen. Logan's already offered it to her. And so, anyways, so then she wants him to tell her why. Right? Why will it not be him? But instead, he just goes in for a hug. So he goes in for a hug, and he starts to tear up to her surprise. And this scene just really turns serious all of a sudden. Um, and he then says, I would just ask that you take care of me. Because if Dad didn't need me right now, I don't exactly know what I would be for. And the delivery here by Jeremy Strong, I again, it's easy to say this, but I think it's the best acted scene for him um, in the series so far. I mean, this scene... Like, the awkwardness of this, the awkwardness of Kendall's character, the emotion, the, the kind of honest, revealing line here of, you know, I wouldn't know what I would be for right now, right, if it wasn't for Dad um, needing me for this. And uh, it's just such an honest, revealing thing, whereas a lot of the show is comedic, a lot of this stuff is kind of, um, you know, meaningless kind of humor here and there with these jokes but this is just such a dramatic, serious scene. Um, and I think the acting here by Jeremy Strong is just off the charts. Uh, off the charts. So then he tells her uh, again that he really can't talk more about it. Of course, he can't, right? He's not going to tell her about the accident. And that it definitely will not be him for CEO, right? He is not going to be chosen for that CEO position. And he walks out. He says, "It's yeah, it ain't going to be me, right? As he's is still really crying, right? At this point, he walks out. So, um, just an honest and revealing statement from Kendall here, really epitomizing how he feels after what happened and what working for his dad has meant to him, right? And I think, to me, it, it's kind of like it's kept him distracted. And otherwise, he may resort to drugs um, and, and, and be letting himself go right now if it wasn't for Logan needing him and for him letting him, you know, work on the proxy deal and all this stuff, and kind of accept him back into the into the good graces of the family. And if it wasn't for that, uh, again, right, he probably would be letting himself go. And I do think this is important because we see multiple shots of him looking out on this balcony of the building's roof in this episode. Just throughout the episode, I think there's three or four shots here, um, even stepping up to the edge of the balcony once. And these scenes were kind of interesting at the time. I believe he's having a cigarette in the one. So it's like... 
right? Like, does this mean something? And I think when we get to this end scene, it really does. Because then at the very end, he goes back up there to the roof and the glass has been built in front of the railing and we see him bang his head against it. And that's where we end off the episode. And so... Now, I'm not sure if they're hinting that he, you know, is, is you know, going to kill himself. He's going to jump off this railing. But I think it does show that that he's really in this kind of dark place where, again, as he says, if he wasn't needed right now, he doesn't know what he would be needed for, as in, you know, he'd probably let himself go, or maybe he would go as far as trying to kill himself or, or something like that, right? And so I think that's what they're kind of hinting at here with showing these different shots um, throughout the episode and at the very end with him banging his head against the glass um, that's now blocking him from that railing. And uh, it was interesting, right? Like, how did the glass get there? Was it supposed to be there? Did Logan kind of catch on and put that up there so that nothing happened? Was he onto him? I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but I think the symbolization and, and the way that this played out was brilliant, and I really liked the way that this episode ended off for Kendall. All right, so I apologize for the length of this one, but uh, just quickly here. So my rating for this episode is going to be a 4.9 out of 5. This is a damn near perfect episode um, of television. I mean, this was just amazing. Um, the only thing that doesn't make this perfect for me would be Roman's part. I think that it could have been done a little bit better, although I really like that they're putting him in a new place, maybe even humbling him a little bit. Um I thought it was a, the, the idea of it was good, but I think we could have had maybe a little bit more time spent on him. Um, and that scene with Jerry at the end was definitely interesting. Um, I don't really count that as a negative. It's not really a positive or a negative. It's just kind of an interesting scene, I guess. Um, but I just felt like they could have maybe spent a little bit more time on him. But other than that, and that's kind of a nitpick, like... Other than that, this episode was damn near perfect, as I said. Um, the Greg and Tom breakup was both hilarious and kind of heartbreaking. I mean, I really don't want to see these two characters broken up. Um, I feel like Tom throwing the water bottles at Greg is kind of the way I, re I react. I'm like, no, like, I don't want these two to be broken up, right? Like, they're the, be you know, like, they're some of the best scenes of the of the show is them two. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I just, uh, I thought that was a really great scene that played out there um, to see Tom's reaction to Greg asking... To, to transfer jobs. I thought it was just such a perfect um, thing there, and I think the acting on both uh, Nicholas Braun and Matthew McFadden were, were, were really great. So, uh, also, Connor was great in this episode. Again, I love that they're giving him some more time here in this season so far, and his part, honestly, was the funniest by far in, in the episode, although, there were, you know, there was some, some hilarious parts as well. Um, but his it, that, that whole shtick with the Mo Lester thing, that was so funny, um, at least to me. I don't know. I, I like that kind of dry, kind of dark humor, if you will, um, and I thought that was really great, um, and I really like that they're exploring Kendall's mental state a little bit more, um, and the end of this episode, again, as I talked about, um, just really, really well done, and uh, I think it really is important to show that, especially after, you know, and, and I think up to, at least to the finale of season one, like, this show wasn't really that dark, really wasn't that dramatic, um, or at least some people may have thought of it that way, um, but once that finale happened, once that thing hit and that thing happened to Kendall, they have to keep exploring that, right? Like they put us in that kind of uh, in that kind of room um, where, you know, okay, we're like we're gonna get really serious, we're gonna get dark here, um, and so now to explore Kendall's uh, state a little bit more and explore this darkness, I think is a really important thing, and and the way that they did this at the end of the episode is just um, fantastic. It's really, really, uh, really awesome, and I'm looking forward to more of that stuff a little bit later, and one thing I did touch on here as well, setting up situations for the right characters. This is just so well done uh, for three examples in this one, but there's probably many more, is putting Roman in the training program, right? A perfect situation for that character, putting Tom as the one interviewing this uh, fascist, you know, accused of being a fascist sympathizer or even a fascist himself, right? Him interviewing him, just a perfect situation. And then Connor going to this funeral and having to write this eulogy. Again, just a perfect situation to put these characters in and makes for an even more entertaining, uh, you know, and, and intriguing uh, episode uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the day. So yeah, really awesome stuff there. Favorite character for this one, I'm going to go with Greg uh, Hirsch, right? Cousin Greg, played by Nicholas Braun. Uh, Nicholas Braun is doing an amazing job. To me, I have seen actually quite a few things that he's been in. Um, like, actually more than I, th I thought I did when I kind of checked his IMDb page. Um, you know, he started out with some Disney stuff, and then now he's in this. I think this is his best work uh, up to this date. I think Nicholas Braun is doing a fantastic job in this show, and in this season in particular. This episode, I thought he was really, really great with some of his delivery. 
the awkwardness. He just nailed it with uh, with Tom in this uh, episode. I thought he was really great. And I'm looking forward to see what Greg uh, will do going forward. Will he kind of get out from Tom's shadow here, right? It's really impressive. He kind of, um, you know, kind of stands up for himself in this episode for the first time. And we'll have to see where he goes from here. But anyways, guys, that'll just about do it for my thoughts on Succession Season 2, Episode 4. Thank you guys so much for watching. And again, love to hear your guys' thoughts on this one and what you think of uh, some of the stuff going forward, what you think might happen. Uh, but anyways, uh, other than that, thank you guys so much for watching this one. And we'll see you then next week for Succession Season 2, Episode 5.